Hello and welcome to this tutorial on the Cisco hierarchical design model. A design model is very, very useful, especially when it comes to network engineering. It enables us to have a common point of reference with all of our colleagues and people from different companies and vendors so that when we talk about a network, be it the design of the network or how it's supposed to function, we can all talk with using the same concepts and have an understanding of what functionality happens at what part of the network. So it's very, very useful. And in addition, it gives us common terminology. So I can say something about a particular function or, or an area where a function exists and everyone else just knows it. They know what we're talking about. And this is very useful because networks vary so different in terms of the business needs uh, behind the network design. So this is a good starting point for anyone looking to understand networks and to talk about it. So we'll jump into the benefits of why we used a hierarchical approach. And then we'll go ahead and we'll look at the model itself and we'll check out each of the three layers of the Cisco model. So it's probably pretty obvious to guess what the benefits are of using a model when you're building anything, be it a high rise or a website. Uh, a model provides this common point of reference. But let's go over some of the specific benefits for networking. You get more predictable networks and behavior. So if you follow a model, you know what's supposed to happen where and you know what to expect. So if you see something different, then you have an idea that, hey, there's a problem and you can more easily troubleshoot it. Also, easily locating and defining network functions is very, very important. You cannot have uh, specific functions scattered throughout the network without any sort of order to it. So if you use a model and the model dictates where certain functions lie, you can easily find them. You can easily see if they're working properly. Also, just generally speaking, it's easier to understand a very complex network if you use a model. And trust me, between companies and the business reason, reasons for creating networks, networks, even though there's a model to, to follow, they vary widely in how they're actually implemented. So using the model as a point of reference makes it far easier to understand something very complex. And really, most networks are complex. Finally, if you're going to design a network, if you're going to actually then build that network and ultimately have to support it, if you have a roadmap telling you where things are and how they're supposed to work, you get benefits in all three of these areas, design, implementation, and support. So those are the benefits. Let's take a look at the model itself. So here's the hierarchical model. We have a core layer, often referred to as your core routers or your core switches. Then you have your distribution layer. And so if you hear the distribution switch or an aggregation switch, often that's referring to the distribution layer. And then finally on the bottom, your access layer. And these are your access switches. So you can see the three layers. The links between them, if you start with the PCs at the bottom, those are just commonly referred to as access links. Between the access layer and the distribution layer, you have uplinks. And then finally, between the distribution layer and the core layer, you have your core links. Overall, this is the model. Now, let's go ahead and drill down into the specifics of each layer. So let's start with the core layer. And here we see it's located at the top of this diagram. The core layer is your network backbone. And this particular layer is responsible for moving large amounts of data at very fast transfer rates. And it's used to aggregate your distribution switches. So the distribution switches are there in the middle. And you can see each layer aggregates the next. So a access switch aggregates all your PCs, meaning many of them co uh, connect to a single access switch. And then your two distribution switches aggregate all of the access switches. So two or more, and here three access switches connect to each aggregation. And so likewise, the core switches aggregate your distribution switches. Now, in smaller networks, sometimes you don't need to use a separate core layer. Sometimes that is collapsed into the distribution layer, sometimes referred to as a collapsed core design. So depending on the size and needs, you may not have to have a separate core layer in your network design. An important thing to note about the core layer is it does not have any direct contact with end user devices. So the PCs at the bottom would never be connected to your core network. Um, keep in mind, though, 
all sorts of weird things happen based on how urgently something needs to be done. So every now and then you will see something hanging off of a core switch or a distribution switch, which doesn't make sense. Talk to somebody who's been there for a while and you figure out there was an emergency and there was a quick fix and it's never been addressed since. Uh, so trust me, this model is strayed from oftentimes. At the core layer, you don't want to do anything to slow it down. So you don't have a lot of policies implemented there. You just want to transfer your data as fast as possible. And keep in mind, at your core layer, there are oftentimes links going to other core switches to other areas of your network. So uh, the point of the core layer is to transfer information between the different areas of the core as quickly as possible. Things to keep in mind, you want to make it highly reliable, very fast, and use routing protocols with very low convergence times. And all of that fits with the primary goal is move large amounts of data as fast as possible. And that is the core layer of the network. Let's go ahead and take a look at the distribution layer. The distribution layer is where we find our routing functions, our layer three functionality. And the distribution layer lies between the core and the access layer, so it's right in the middle. And this is where the majority of, of the more complicated work is, is located on a network. So in addition to providing routing, we have a lot of our filtering and security happening at the distribution layer, as well as WAN access is usually located at the distribution layer. You notice, again, we mentioned aggregation, so we have our access switches, and normally we would have say you could have more than just three listed here, but each of the aggregation, each of the distribution layer switches aggregates all of the access switches. Another thing in common with the core layer is that the distribution layer does not usually have contact, direct contact with end user devices. So again, you're not gonna see a, uh, a server or a PC hanging off of a distribu distribution layer switch. Again, there are caveats in every network implementation, but generally speaking, you shouldn't see that. Distribution layer switches enable devices on different access switches to communicate. So for instance, the PC here needs to talk to this PC. It would traverse a distribution switch. So by aggregating all the switches together, the distribution switches enable devices on different access switches to actually communicate to each other. So here you get an idea of network flow, network traffic flow. By the very definition of the distribution layer, this is what's happening. So you get an idea of functionality here. When you're implementing a network design, the distribution layer, as we mentioned, security, your routing, network policies of all sort, any sort of routing redistribution happens here. If you have VLANs on your layer two network, this is where the inter-VLAN routing occurs. So again, you need a routing device in order to route between VLANs. This is where it would happen. And because of that, the distribution layer is where broadcast and collision domains are defined. Um, if you haven't yet checked out the tutorials on broadcast and collision domains, definitely take a, a moment to, to view those. But this is where those are defined. So generally speaking, the distribution layer, it's a workhorse. That's where a lot of the nitty gritty happens in terms of uh, policy and routing. So let's take a look at the access layer. The access layer is where our switching or layer two functionality resides and each access layer switch generally has two uplinks to the distribution layer. And that could be done for redundancy, should one link fail, you have a backup, or depending on the design, it could be done for load balancing. So perhaps you have so much traffic, a single link would be saturated, so you need to balance the traffic between both. Again, it depends on the design, but it's a possibility. The access layer is where access to the network is controlled. So you have PCs and servers connected there. Well, on the access layer switch, you can control is the port administratively up or down? What kind of security policy is associated to it? Um, it is the, the area where devices are connected. So it makes sense that that's where you can control what's connected and how they're connected. The access layer also supports traffic for connected devices. So what we mean by that is if this PC wants to talk to this one, it goes like that. Or if I want to talk to this one, it goes like that. What it does not do 
is it doesn't go directly from one access layer switch to another and then to an end device. So access layer switches are not transit switches. Why? Well, that functionality is located at the distribution layer. So when this PC wants to talk to this PC, it routes via the distribution. It doesn't route directly from one access switch to another. Generally speaking, the access switches are lower end switch models. They don't have as many requirements um, and detailed sophistication functionality as your distribution layer. So they're lower model and usually less expensive. And when implementing the access layer, uh, keep in mind access control policies like we mentioned and collision domains are created here. And that's it. That is the Cisco hierarchical uh, design model. Let's go ahead and take a quick summary of what we went over. So we know there are many benefits to using a design model like this one, and primarily it gives us a common point of reference and common terminology to discuss networks. And then we looked at the three layers of the hierarchical model. The core layer, which is your network backbone, fast transit of information. And then you have your distribution layer where your layer three functionality takes place and your security policies and a lot of the work done on the network. And then finally your access layer, which is your switching layer, and this controls access to the network. And there you have it. That is the model used for Cisco hierarchical network design. Thanks for watching.